the primary structure of a polypeptide describes that polypeptide as being a linear polymer of a specific sequence of amino acids. Now, once the polypeptide forms its primary structure, what happens next? Well, next, that primary polypeptide begins to twist and begins to turn via these regular patterns. And there are four different types of regular patterns. We have alpha helixes, we have beta pleated sheets, we have beta turns, and we have omega loops. And these four different types of regular patterns uh, compose the secondary structure of our protein, of our polypeptide. Now, the question is, how exactly does the polypeptide begin to twist to form these four different types of structures? Well, inside the polypeptide, we have different bonds. Now, the peptide bonds are the bonds holding the amino acids inside the polypeptide together. And these peptide bonds have a double bond character. And what that means is they don't actually rotate, but all the other single bonds inside the polypeptide chain do rotate and it's the rotation of these other single bonds inside the polypeptide chain that allows the linear polypeptide to eventually fold into the beta pleated sheet, into the alpha helix, into the beta turn and our omega loop. Now, once we form these regular patterns, the question is, what exactly stabilizes these structures and allows them to exist in the first place? Well, it's the hydrogen bonds that exist between the amino acids in that polypeptide chain, as we'll see in just a moment, that allows each one of these secondary structures to actually exist in the first place. So, let's begin with the alpha helix. So, what exactly is an alpha helix? Well, an alpha helix is formed when we have our polypeptide chain and that polypeptide chain begins to twist to form a rod-like structure. And inside that rod-like structure, we have the backbone and on the outside, we have those R-chain groups that are pointing outside of that alpha helix. So the alpha helix is a rod-like structure as shown on the board that contains the backbone being in the inside of that helix helix and the side chain groups on the outer portion of that helix. Now, let's suppose that this is our axis of rotation. So the axis of rotation along which that alpha helix actually forms runs, runs along the x-axis in this direction. So this is the beginning of our polypeptide and this is the end. So we see that in this case we go into the board, then we come out of the board, we go into the board, out of the board, we go into the board, out of the board, we go into the board, out of the board, of the board and so forth. So the screw sense of our alpha helix basically describes the directionality of rotation about the axis of rotation for that particular alpha helix. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, if this is the axis of rotation, so and if we look at the axis of rotation and we examine the directionality of that rotating alpha helix, the rotating polypeptide chain, in this case, it will point in the clockwise direction so going this way is clockwise and in this particular case the screw sense of this alpha helix is clockwise and this is known as the right hand helix. Now we can also have a left hand helix in which the directionality is reversed it would be counterclockwise. Now the left hand uh, the left handed helix is much less stable because there is more steric hindrance there is a greater number of collisions because between the R chains of our polypeptide and so because of that the energy level of the left-handed helix is higher than the energy level of the right-handed helix and what that means is for the majority of the proteins that contain the alpha helix it will be the right-handed helix and not the left-handed helix that will exist within that protein so the right-handed alpha helix predominates because there is less steric hindrance between the side chains on our alpha helix. Now, the final thing I'd like to mention about the alpha helix is the actual hydrogen bonding that exists between our amino groups. 
So let's suppose that this is our uh, this is our amino acid that we're actually examining. So this is our amino acid, and this green bond is the peptide bond that does not rotate that connects this amino acid to the next amino acid. Then we have this peptide bond that connects to this amino acid, and so forth. So remember, these green bonds are peptide bonds, and because those peptide bonds are resonance stabilized, they have a double bond character and they will not rotate but these other bonds are single bonds and they do rotate and it's their rotation that allows this helix and the other structures of the secondary structure to actually form in the first place now once we form them it's the hydrogen bonds that exist between the NH group of one amino acid and the CO group of another amino acid that stabilizes these structures and allows them to exist exist for an extended period of time. Now let's focus on this amino acid here. So we see that we have this NH group of this amino acid here that interacts with the CO group of this amino acid here. The question is, what is the numerical relationship between this group here and this group here? So let's count. So we have this peptide bond here, so let's call this amino acid number one. Then we have this peptide here, we have amino acid number two, we have this peptide here, amino acid number three, and finally we have this peptide here, and amino acid number four. And so what we see is, if this is our amino acid that contains the NH group, then it will interact with the CO group, with the, um, uh, uh, the CO group of the amino acid that is found four units ahead of that particular amino acid. And this is always true for the alpha helix. So it's the NH group of one amino acid that interacts with the CO group of the amino acid that is found four units ahead of that amino acid. And the reason this takes place is because these are the groups that are found in closest proximity and are able to interact strongly. Now let's move on to the beta pleated sheets. We see that in the alpha helix, we, ha we, we, uh, we have this helical directionality of our polypeptide. But in the beta pleated sheets, these polymers are linear. So the polypeptide is linear and they're basically stacked on top of one another. Now, just like in the helical case where we have two different types of alpha helixes, we have the right-handed and the left-handed, we also have two two types of beta pleated sheets. So we can have these two linear peptides or polypeptide chains uh, basically point in the opposite directions or they can point in the same direction. So anti-parallel directionality basically means they are stacked on top of one another but they point in opposite directions. And the parallel beta sheet basically means they're stacked on top of one another and they point in the same direction. So let's begin with the anti-parallel parallel case and let's discuss how the bonding actually takes place within the anti-parallel beta pleated sheets. Now, because we essentially have one of these chains running in this direction and the other one is reversed, we see that these groups actually line up with one another perfectly. And what that means is, if we examine this amino acid here and this amino acid here, they're groups that are able to interact line up perfectly. So we have this hydrogen accepting group that interacts with this hydrogen donating group on the other amino acid and here we have this hydrogen donating group that interacts with this hydrogen accepting group of the other opposing amino acid. So in the anti-parallel beta sheets we see that the NH and the CO groups of an amino acid on one strand interact with the CO and NH groups of the opposing amino acid on the other strand. So we have a one-to-one -one perfect interaction between our uh, groups on opposing amino acids. Now, 
How exactly can this actually exist? Well, let's imagine we have our polypeptide that runs in the following direction and somewhere here we have a turn that will take place and that turn can be a beta turn that we're going to discuss in just a moment and once that turn takes place it extends and moves in the opposite direction and so we have the anti-parallel arrangement of our two strands of polypeptide. Now, in this particular case, the only difference is there's still a parallel with respect to one another, but now they run in the same direction. And what that will do is it will change the type of interaction that exists between our amino acids. In this case, we have a one-to-one -one interaction. So one amino acid interacts with the opposing amino acid, but here we have one amino acid interacts with two different amino acids on the opposing strand. So let's call this amino acid number one, this let's call amino acid number two, and this amino acid number three. So we have the NH bond of amino acid number one interacts with the CO bond of amino acid two on the opposing strand, and the CO bond of this amino acid number one interacts with the NH a group of a different amino acid on that opposing strand, we call that amino acid 3. So in the parallel beta sheet, the adjacent strands run in the same direction and an amino acid on one strand connects to two amino acids on the opposing strand via the hydrogen bond. So we see that not only do we have these opposing directions, but because in this case we have the opposing directions, they they line up perfectly but in this case because they run in the same direction they don't line up perfectly and so we have this type of one to two interaction as opposed to one to one in this case. Now the final type of secondary structure that I'd like to discuss are the beta turns. So what do we mean by beta turn and why do our polypeptides need to create these beta turns in the first place? Well, if we examine the three-dimensional structure of polypeptides, we'll see that the structure is very, very compact. And the compactness of that polypeptide is because the polypeptide is able to make many sharp turns as it conforms into that three-dimensional structure. And this ability to form these turns is known as beta turning, and these turns themselves are known as beta turns or reverse turns. So the compact nature of proteins is in part due to the polypeptide's ability to make these sudden turns known as the beta turns. Now, in the same way that the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet are stabilized by hydrogen bonds, these abrupt turns are also stabilized by H bonds. And to see what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram. So let's suppose we have a, a polypeptide that runs, eventually turns in the following direction. So this is, let's say, the nth amino acid in our sequence. This is the n plus one amino acid. This is the n plus two amino acid. This is the n plus three amino acid and so forth. Now to actually stabilize the beta turn and to make sure that it is stabilized and exists for an extended period of time, we have to have a bond that forms between the CO group. So, wow, this is an H, not an N. So if we examine the nth amino acid, the CO group of the nth amino acid interacts with the NH group of the N plus three amino acid. And this is the hydrogen bond that stabilizes our beta turns. And these beta turns are usually found on the surface of that amino, uh, of that polypeptide. And what that means is these R chains found on the beta turns are the ones that interact with the polar nature, the polar solvents found outside our protein as well as with the molecules, the macromolecules that interact with our protein in general. So these are the different types of secondary structure that exist that make up our polypeptide. 